Welcome to the Jonathan Van Bilsen Show featuring lively, in-depth conversation with compelling guests from our community. And here is our host, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank you and welcome. Current COVID restrictions have made it impossible for us to film in the studio. So we'll be doing this show remotely, which is certainly different, but we're getting the hang of it and I'm looking forward to it. Our guest today is someone who has accomplished a great deal and certainly has great plans for the future. He's had a successful photo finishing business, a coffee company, and became the CEO of Medical Associates of Port Perry. Recently, he was appointed the board chair of the Oak Ridges Hospice in Port Perry. Please welcome Mr. Stephen Gray. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. So just to, to dig a little bit back into your background, Stephen, I understand you were born in Manchester, England, and then your family uprooted and went to Alberta, if I'm not mistaken. Close to Manchester. I was actually uh, born in uh, Birmingham. Uh, so okay. right, uh, almost uh, dead center of uh, uh, the UK, England. Yeah. And, and when you were in Alberta, you were very entrepreneurial, aside from the typical paper routes when you were little. I understand that you got into the photo finishing business, which is certainly different and interesting, something that we don't have anymore today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was, uh, boy, that's uh, taking me back a little bit. That was quite some time ago. I think 1991 is when we started that, uh, that company. Um, and yeah, we had photo finishing uh, labs where we, uh, you know, for those that remember traditional film, uh, you brought in your roll of film for your camera and we would process it. Uh, and, uh, and now, of course, everything is dig digital. Of course, and that was the one hour uh, photo finishing, which was amazing back then. I think just the fact that you could take pictures and have them developed in an hour. Yeah, now it's a second and you've got a digital image. I know. I mean, I've obviously I've done a lot of photography over the years and I know going to faraway places with 30 or 40 rolls of film is was not uncommon. And then developing them and having to mortgage my house just to pay for the developing of the film. That's right. So that's totally, uh, totally by the wayside. So from from there, I understand you went into the coffee business, which is different again. Yeah, so that was prompted by my move to Ontario from uh, from Alberta in 1998, and uh, I met up with a, a fellow who was in the coffee business, uh, and we started a company in 2000, 2001, and we uh, uh, we roasted coffee in a uh, small plant here in Port Perry, and we slowly expanded that over uh, over the years, and ultimately sold the company in uh, uh, 2010. And it was, I believe it was called Cameron Coffee, is that correct? Yeah, Cameron's Coffee. So my, my business partner's name was Ian Cameron. Um, so we, uh, it sounded better, Cameron's Coffee, than Gray Coffee. So we went with Cameron's. Uh, and yeah, we supplied uh, grocery stores and other you know, small uh, retailers as well as cafes uh, and um, uh, you know, restaurants, those kinds of things. I do remember at, at uh, Medical Associates, I believe they were selling it there as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah. The small uh, cafe that we had there was uh, was supplied by us, yeah. So is it still a going entity or is it uh, shut down? Well, actually, Jonathan, the brand is still going. So the company we sold the product, uh, the, the branding to and the, and, and the business, um, yeah, still has Cameron's Coffee. I still see it from time to time on a, on a van that goes through, through town. So uh, yeah, it's nice to see that even 10 years, uh, 11 years later. Excellent. So you ended up in Port Perry mainly because of your, your wife, I guess, and your family situation. Yeah. And now you're a CMA. And was that something that you accomplished before you came back here? Or was that something that you uh, took up here? I actually wrote my, my exam. So you're right, a CMA, a Certified Management Accountant, which of course now a few years ago, the three designations, accounting designations were merged into CPA. Um, but yes, I took the CMA exam uh, in Alberta in 1998, uh, and then I, in 1996, I had met a, um, a young lady from Bowmanville, a Bowmanville girl, and uh, we moved out to Port Perry in 1998. So actually, right after writing my exam, we moved. I think we arrived July 1st in Port Perry. I'd written my exam in June. Uh, and then in Ontario here, I did the two years of um, professional development and practical um, development that's required as part of the CMA program. So I did that here in Ontario and then received my certification in 2000. So as a, a barista who, with photo finishing experience, how, how does one get into medical associates? Because it's not exactly a related field. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, so in 2007 is when I joined Medical Associates and Medical Associates was, um, was active in um, hiring uh, a, a, new, uh, a new person for the leadership position. And they had actually secured the, um, uh, 
the services of, of a consulting company to, to assist them in that uh, search. Uh, and one of the physicians who, who knew of me had asked if um, I would consider applying. Uh, so I did give it some thought and um, it, uh, you know, it did interest me. And so I, I did apply through the, through the consultant and through the process and was fortunate enough, to, uh, fortunate enough to be the successful candidate. And I've been here since 2007. In fact, uh, next month will be 14 years. Wow. Time goes quickly, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And obviously you're enjoying it. Now, I did want to touch on the fact, and I know we're going to talk about the hospice in detail, but I did want to touch on the fact of the pandemic and medical associates and how you operate. I understand when you started, there were around 20 or so doctors. Now you've got about 40 physicians, which is a fantastic growth rate for a small community like Skugog. How, how have you changed and what, what has the pandemic meant to your, your day-to-day operation? Well, I mean, it's, you know, we're still, our, our purpose is still to deliver healthcare to this community. We have a very committed, uh, very committed team um, in an effort to do that. But, you know, some of the things, obviously, we, we're all as individuals impacted by this pandemic. So, you know, all of our team members are subject to the same uh, restrictive activities and limitations at home than, than, than everybody else is. Um, you know, we have seen some changes in the clinic in terms of how we're able to deliver services because of obviously the, um, the, the PPE requirements and the limitations around social distancing and physical distancing, number of people in the building, those kinds of things. And, you know, many people have um, gone through our screening process at the building. So, you know, have an understanding of that. Um, but some of the other things and activities that we're engaged in as a clinic and as a team uh, include things like the CAC, so that's something very different. So the, the COVID Assessment Center, which of course is just down the road at Prince Albert, uh, so that's running seven days a week um, uh, and is staffed by our team here in Port Perry and a partnership with uh, with the Oxbridge Physician Group as well. And that's been running since uh, late July, so we're not far off a year, seven days a week uh, over in that facility. Uh, and then, of course, more recently, we've started the vaccination uh, clinic here uh, at Port Perry um, in our medical facility. So there are a number of activities that are taking place that are outside the norm, um, yet we're still delivering the norm, if you like. Um, and I know the, you know, the, the message I continue to give to our team is that, um, you know, we're individuals as well. And, you know, we'll all get through this if we're, if we're kind to one another, if we support one another. And, you know, I have to say our team is, uh, is a, a remarkably resilient team um, and has done, uh, has done just that. Absolutely. I, I have nothing but praise for everyone who, who's associated with it. And, and to me, it's the little things like, for example, when this first started over a year ago, the first thing, one of the first things you did was you eliminated the cost for parking which is, is a, uh, people don't understand here how, how, how much of a difference that makes. When you go to Toronto, if you go to Toronto General or Sick Kids Hospital, you're not only paying in around four to, to $6 an hour, but there's no limit. So you have to constantly run back out and put money in the meter or use your app to pay for parking. And, and little things like that, that, that really help the community, I think are very much appreciated. And, and in a lot of cases go unnoticed. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it, it, you're right. It is the little things that that uh, make a difference. And, you know, it, it doesn't take long for all those little things to add up. Uh, and so, you know, we do want to focus on those those little things. And, and so I'm, I'm pleased the community has. Uh, and I won't ask I won't ask you on air once the pandemic's over, is the parking going to remain free? We'll 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 touch that. Maybe we'll do another show then. Thank you. <laughs> OK, the Oak Ridge is hospice. Now, this is something that's that's fairly new uh, conceptually for this area. Uh, the building has pretty well been constructed and, and is, is pretty close to opening. It's located on uh, Highway 7A, just beside the Catholic Church on the south side of 7A, for those who, who do not know where it is. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, Stephen, um, who are some of the main people behind the project? Oh, well, there are, there are a lot of people involved, of course. Um, everybody will probably know Dr. Steve Russell. Uh, who was the board chair for five years and is now the medical um, director. He has been the face of the hospice. Um, those videos that uh, people have probably seen uh, that are on our website and in various locations and newspapers and radio, and um, you know, he has absolutely been the face of the, of the hospice and a, and a driving force. Uh, our board consists of uh, Gail Guimond, who um, has been a um, tremendous asset to Oak Ridges in her work uh, in moving this along. She's been in, uh, at the board for five plus years now, almost six. 
Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, David um, Sidhu and Kevin Morgan, whom the house is named after. Uh, they're our um, sort of founding donors, uh, so they each contributed a significant amount of money, which is really the uh, the launch of um, uh, of this project. It was it was really them that um, got this started, and I, you know I'm happy to go into some history about how you know Oak Ridge's uh, Oak Ridge uh, Hospice uh, came to be, and it's a long it's a long history. There's uh, a lot more. Uh, that has, uh, you know, sort of under the, the weeds that take place to, to get something like this uh, to fruition. So I, I can imagine. I mean, it's, it's a substantial facility. Uh, so what sort of history are you referring to? Well, I mean, it goes back really to 2005 um, in Ontario when um, the government at the time announced um, a strategy for some funding with respect to um, supporting end-of-life care. And it was at that time that uh, Dr. Russell... Uh, who had an interest uh, in palliative care, and, and that was part of his practice, um, gathered a few community health community members together uh, to start this journey uh, in trying to bring a hospice to Port Perry. So, I mean, that's 15, 16 years ago. Uh, and then um, they went through that process for a while, and then ultimately they combined with um, Durham Hospice, which some will be familiar with, and that was around 2008. Um, and that effort then was to bring hospice to the region of Durham. And so there were some fundraising efforts that took place and, you know, a fair bit of work that went into, um, you know, that, advancing that initiative. But in 2013, things had, uh, the momentum had slowed a little bit. Um, and so it wasn't really until 2015 when, when Dr. Russell received a call out of the blue uh, from Kevin Morgan. And Kevin had said to Dr. Russell, I'm interested in um, supporting uh, a hospice. I have some funds that uh, myself and a, a fellow business person in Pickering, they both live in Pickering, David City and Kevin Morgan. Um, we have some money we would like to contribute to hospice. We've been looking around Durham um, and we heard about Port Perry and we heard specifically about um, Dr. Steve Russell and his efforts. And so they, um, they met with Steve and as it turns out, uh, they have a connection, I think, through Western University. They both went to Western and, and played on the same rugby team. So uh, they ended up uh, sort of reconnecting uh, from a personal level as well. Um, but it was really that in 2015 that, uh, that really got the hospice moving along. And their considerable donation was the kickstart to a much, um, you know, a very successful and broad fundraising campaign. Um, we're at two, 2021. We're just opening. Uh, and, you know, Kevin and David came forward in 2015. So there's six years uh, of work that took place to get it um, to this point. So, you know, why it may it may look like um, it, it happened fairly quickly. There's there's a fair bit of time that has gone into this. And, you know, in 2015 is when Kevin and, and David stepped up. And then uh, we looked at um, uh, we looked at purchasing land in 2017. And in, in during that time, we were fundraising. And then uh, through the construction process, and here we are. So six years. That's amazing. And uh, when we come back, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the Oak Ridge Hospital, Hospice, and we're going to delve a little bit into some of the people that make it happen, as well as the facility itself. I had a, a tour of it, and I was very, very impressed. There's, there's just I was breathless and speechless as far as to what I saw and the quality of work it blew me away. Stephen, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Belsen for Photos and Travel, where we bring the world to your doorstep. Traveling during this pandemic is virtually at a standstill. However, thanks to Rogers and YouTube, my new show, Photos and Travel, is heading into its second season. Join me for a new episode every month when we get together and explore exotic locales around the world. Check local listings for dates and times or search Jonathan Van Belsen's Photos and Travel on YouTube. Welcome back. Many of you have seen the advertisements for the new Oak Ridges Hospice. And our guest today is the chair of the board, Mr. Stephen Gray. Stephen, welcome back. Thanks, John. So let's talk a little bit about the hospice. First of all, can you explain exactly what the purpose of it is? Sure. So the hospice really is there to provide a home-like setting where people at the end of their lives can have their final days spent with dignity and comfort. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was not too long ago, a poll was done in Canada and uh, Canadians were asked, you know, where would their, pre where would they like to live their final days? 
And 96% of them, um, as I'm sure it comes uh, no surprise, would prefer to die at home uh, around family uh, in a comfortable setting like that. I wasn't actually aware that that the number was that high. I did not know that. Yeah, it's very high. And and but sadly, many die in hospital because, you know, spending your last days at home um, can be challenging for families because families ultimately become caregivers because uh, there's a lot of support that's needed to make that patient um, comfortable. And while there are many cases of individuals being very successful at being at home, uh, not everyone can. So the hospice offers a home-like setting uh, where residents there can live their final days. And, and usually that's two to three weeks. Um, it's not a long time at the hospice. They are at the end of their uh, uh, journey. And it provides families an opportunity to be loved ones rather than caregivers. Uh, so that's really what the hospice is about. And is is the facility open to everyone is it open to people in port perry only is it durham how does how does that work and and more importantly i guess how how is it determined that someone gets to go there right so it is a um it is a durham region hospice uh, so while it resides in port perry it's available to uh to those uh, who live in durham uh, the intake process is directly with the uh, oak ridges hospice uh, and that process will be coming online uh, soon once the hospice uh, opens its doors to receive uh, residents. And those referrals can come in from uh, healthcare providers. They can come in from uh, those uh, individuals who need the hospice directly. Uh, it can come in from family members uh, through self-referrals. Uh, so as long as you're, um, you're in Durham, um, you, can, uh, you can access the, the hospice through a referral system. And now, is there a charge for staying there? No, nope, the hospice uh, is uh, is no cost. Okay, I, I have no concept of what the numbers would be. I know you have a total of of uh, ten rooms facilitating eight people. Uh, is is that uh, on average what what you require, or is there like a, would there be a list of of a hundred people? Um, how does that work? Well, I mean, in order to maintain that home like setting. Uh, we need to keep it small. So you're right, our hospice is built for 10 beds. Um, we were originally funded for five, uh, and uh, through some uh, effort and work uh, of those involved, we were able to, and the support of the Lynn and the Ministry of Health, we were able to move that to eight. So we are funded for eight beds. Um, we have the facilities to accommodate uh, 10, should we um, be able to expand uh, those uh, two extra beds in the future. Which, which I, I assume is also good because if someone leaves, you're going to need time to to redo that room. So the next person will be able to go into one of those two spare rooms sort of thing to to keep it working. Uh, I'm assuming that that's that would happen. Yeah, I, I, most likely the um, those two rooms won't be uh, available for use because there are obviously some costs involved in uh, furnishing those appropriately and um, readying those for uh for, for residents. So those rooms will be um, not used until we're able to have funding uh, flow for them. How, how many hospices are there in Durham region? Now there's one. So Durham has been uh, quite far behind other regions in the province with respect to hospice. Uh, and now having said that, there are two other active um, groups, uh, one in Whitby and one in Carrington. Um, who are in the process of fundraising, uh, have, um, have secured some land, I believe. And I'm sure um, in the not too distant future, uh, we'll begin um, construction of their projects as well, which is very welcome news. And is there sort of a governing board for all of Durham region for the hospice or do they operate totally independently? Yeah, they're relatively independent. Although of course we're connected with one another uh, in order to support each other. Um, at some point in the future, there may be a, um, uh, you know, a, a more centralized intake um, process uh, to support, um, you know, multiple hospices. But uh, ultimately, the uh, each individual hospice is um, operating uh, in relatively independently. You touched briefly on the funding of the, the establishment. My understanding is that a great, great part of it is funded by the community itself. Is that yeah. correct? That is correct. A significant part, in fact, um, because, of course, there's two there's two components to the funding. There's the capital uh, funding, which um, we require to, to to build the um, facility. 
And that um, is supported uh, in, in small part by the Ministry of, of Health. There is some small uh, contribution on the part of the government. I, I shouldn't say small because it's significant, um, but um, the overwhelming amount. Um, small in proportion. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Small in proportion. Um, and then it's the, it's the community uh, that raised uh, the funds um, to, to build it. And then to operate it, the, uh, the Ministry of Health provides about 50% of the cost um to to run the hospice so <clears throat> there's continuing fundraising that will have to be done um to uh to keep the hospice operating and that'll be through the community so i've, I've had a tour of the facility i was blown away it was, it's it's unbelievably amazing uh you may want to touch on a couple of the things that that are quite unique uh for example i saw one of the rooms where I guess the patient, for lack of a better word, um, has, has a pretty sophisticated bed. But next to that is a couch, which turns into a bed as well, which I assume is for, for a relative to, to spend the night. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, the rooms are, um, you know, as large as we could make them. And so we needed some creativity in, in, in how we can uh, support uh, family members who wish to stay overnight um, close to their loved ones. And so you're, you're exactly right. That couch can flip into a little bed right next to the, um, to the resident in the room uh, for, for those who wish to stay over, which is great. And I, the, the rooms that I did see all seem to have a, a beautiful window view of outside, a little patio where people, I guess, can sit uh, on a nice summer day and enjoy a, a coffee or, or something. Yep. Yeah. Very much so, and and you know that's that's in keeping with this goal of making this homelike. So it's not meant to, meant to be an institutional environment. Um, it's meant to you know mimic uh, home, and so large windows, lots of light, um, you know, comfortable surroundings, uh, furniture that you typically see in your home, uh, and the patios, as you point out, are, are great with with extra wide doors so that um, the the bed can actually be moved out. Um, right. if the resident so chooses. So. Yeah, the beds themselves look pretty, uh, it, it's interesting. They, they look, uh, they don't look clinical, I guess is the best way to put it. I, I know because of the controls that you see, uh, they are definitely uh, electronic type beds with lots of, of bells and whistles, but they don't have that look. They don't have that hospital gurney look to them, which, which is nice. Um, also, the the I noticed the surroundings of the the building, the, the walls, the paint choices in that are very soothing. The art that's on the walls uh, is is not lively, you know, wake up staring your face sort of thing. It all kind of flows, you know, wooded scenes that that type of thing. Which which again, um, who who's behind all that? Who who puts the whole uh, touch on on it is it the architects is it the designers is it uh, yourself well it's not me jonathan <laughs> <laughs> we've got a you know we've got some great people have been involved in this um project um you know trish thompson who is um our project manager for construction um you know Bet betty hodgins uh, and Wright. um you know I, the, the list goes on but you know a, a lot of effort has gone into you know making this a very comfortable place for people to be you know that that is its purpose so as you point out the art and the soothing colors um you know everything is meant to to make that environment uh, comfortable uh, for both residents and and families and and the structure is you have a you have the board obviously who's responsible for for the overall decision making you've got dr steve russell who's the medical director then you have, do you have a, a president? Do you have a, a chair, like a, who oversees the day-to-day -day operations, the CEO or? Yeah, so we have um, <clears throat> Brent Farr is our executive director who was recently hired. Uh, Brent comes from uh, community care um, of Durham. Um, in his past, that he's a Durham resident, um, obviously familiar with um, healthcare uh, in, in Durham. And so, uh, you know, we, we're, we're so fortunate to have uh, Brent leading the, uh, leading the team there. Um, and as you point out, the board uh, consists of five individuals. Uh, and uh, yes, the board is there for um, for for governance and and uh, you know strategic uh, decision making um, and to support Brent in his um, in his work to to operate it. so the the board is is there obviously to to make sure that everything stays in place is the board made up largely of medical oriented people or is it a variety of, of people from across the the, the it, board 
Customers. It's a variety, Ashley, and I think that's important for a board. Um, you know, we want to ensure that we have uh, diverse skills um, that um, can can um, can be part of important board decisions. Uh, and so, uh, although there's some medical um, expertise, uh, there's a lot of business expertise around that table as well. Uh, so we do have a diverse um, a diverse board, which is great. Excellent. I know when I had my tour, it's, it's amazing. Port Perry is a relatively small community and the people that, that you run into, like Brent, you mentioned as, as the executive director with, with a, a fantastic amount of knowledge and, and a wealth of experience from his community care days. Betty Hodgins, of course, who, who oversaw the construction of the new library. So she certainly has a lot of insight. I also ran into Wayne Bauer, who people will know from a, a shop that he used to own on Queen Street. And I understand Wayne has joined your group as well. Yeah, Wayne is our facilities coordinator. Um, so I, I met Wayne for the first time oh, a couple months ago. Um, when he uh, when he started, uh, very nice gentleman, and we're we're thrilled to have him as part of our team as well. Right, um, and then of course Michelle, who is is your point person from a communications perspective. Yeah, and that's right. We will be putting the uh, email address and names and that on the screen as we uh, as we go through this show, just so that people can have a point of contact should they wish to 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 do that or to simply find out more information about it. The a uh, community of Port Perry has been supportive for, for anything and everything that happens. Uh, it seems that that people just have deep pockets and continue to to give even during this pandemic. Uh, I'm assuming that the answer to the next question is a positive one, but is the community uh, on board with this whole project? Well, I think, you know, the evidence, the proof is in the pudding, right? The The hospice is there and it's there because this community supported it. Um, and, you know, when you talk about the hospice um, with so many individuals, um, many have had some sort of experience with the passing of a loved one. Um, and those experiences are very different. Some of them are, are very good experiences and others um, are, were more challenging. And so the concept of the hospice resonates with almost everybody you speak to. Uh, and, you know, this is another healthcare asset within our community. And, you know, this community is so supportive of its healthcare and it's been no different with the hospice, which is wonderful. It is a great community. I noticed your donor wall when you first walk in, it's it's just, it's filled with people who are well known in the community. Uh, a friend of mine, as a matter of fact, is a wood turner by, by hobby. And he has spent a lot of time with people who are on the last, last uh, phase of their life just just showing them how to do wood turning and things like that so that's the type of stuff that that will be incorporated i'm sure going forward into facilities that you have um steven unfortunately our time is is near its end it goes very very quickly and it's a very very interesting subject i would love to follow up uh, on a future date uh with, with more information about it especially when it's going so i'd like to thank you very very much for participating and being here today my pleasure jonathan Next month, my guest will be Sandra Spears, who's going to give us an in-depth overview of the Legion. A lot of people don't know what the Legion is or exactly what it does, so it'll be interesting to find that out. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank you very much for watching, and stay safe.